that process. You got a Bible? Let me do a couple of verses. I'm going to go to Psalms. Uh, let's go to Isaiah first. Isaiah 40. Just uh, I'm going to read this out of uh, the message. It's Isaiah chapter 40. I think he's going to throw up the, uh, uh, the King James. But I was reading this this morning when I was up and didn't get it in my notes. So uh, Isaiah chapter 40, about verse 27 uh, he's the creator of all that you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out, doesn't pause to catch his breath, and he knows everything inside out. He energizes those who get tired, gives fresh strength to drop outs, for even young people tire and drop out. Young folk in the prime stumble and fall, but those that wait upon God get fresh strength. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. Man, I love that verse. And then I'm going to go to Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Say that with me. In Him, in Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Father, I pray this morning that we would catch the reality that you've delivered us, that you've set us free, that, Lord, you never grow weak, you never grow tired, and that you continue to feed us and to strengthen us out of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I have studied eagles for years. Most of you in this room have heard me teach about the eagles and that whole series, and I, I, I'm not going to do it again, but I am going to reference several things. That, that word, wait upon the Lord, it doesn't mean to wait for someone to show up at the coffee shop. It doesn't mean that. It means to be bound together. It means to be twisted together. It means to become so unified with that you can't tell the difference between. It really has the connotations of marriage in it. It comes out of another verse to where a threefold cord is not easily broken. In other words, you're, you're, you're intertwined. Those that are intertwined with the Lord, those that have become so connected to the Lord, they're going to rise up. They're going to, it's not about, well, I'm just going to sit here and wait. It's about being so unified that his strength becomes your strength. That his thoughts become your, your thoughts. To, to those that spend time trying to become, they, they, they are the ones. And that if we study eagles and they soar higher, they, they fish, they, they catch live, they can see, they're, they're tremendous animals. They're a tremendous uh, picture of the beauty and the power and all of that 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 represents for us. Uh, and the, the thing that I have read that is most intriguing to me is how they can be captured. Because in the reality of it is, this, this bird is unstoppable. He can't, they, they renew themselves, live about 120 years, they have the same mate for life, uh, and yet they can be ensnared. And to even think about an eagle being trapped is, first of all, a bit mind-boggling when you realize what capabilities that they have. But they can be trapped. And they're trapped basically because somebody lays a fish or something on, on a high, high rock and uh, the, the eagle himself opts for an easy picking. Opts not to soar real high. Opts not to go hunting on himself. Opts to just get this thing that's easy next door, right there. And when he does, generally there's either some sort of a snare that traps his feet, or sometimes there's even this cage that falls clear over him, and he's trapped. And he's trapped in that reality, and they actually harness that eagle, and uh, they can actually shame that bird into thinking he's a chicken. Because when you're created for that kind of potential to be trapped, will discourage you, disarm you. And all of a sudden, instead of being this magnificent creature, now you're trapped in a cage all because you tried to catch something that was already dead. And you wanted to feed off something that was already... Am I making sense? That most powerful force in the world is shame. It, it, it is a powerful force. You shame somebody and you can literally cause them to live so far below their potential and be limited by that sense of failure, to be limited 
be domesticated, if you will. I've literally studied and read about how all of a sudden these beautiful animals are walking around without even a covering. They're just walking around just like a barnyard. Adam in the garden was created to rule the world, created to dominate, created to take care of, to be the viceroy, if you will, of this planet. And he went for the easy, if you think about it, this whole mess we're in is because he ate an apple. Wasn't because he slept with the wrong woman. Wasn't because he robbed a bank. Wasn't because he committed murder. He ate an apple. That seems like nothing to me. I mean, it seems like, God, can you get over it a bit? But the, the truth is, is that Adam did the one thing that we cannot allow ourselves to do, and that's to distrust God. The minute we distrust God is the minute that we're separated from God. And you see, the enemy of our souls came in and planted this seed that God could not be trusted. You couldn't trust God to be good to you. You couldn't trust God to take care of you. You couldn't trust God to feed you of everything you needed to know. You couldn't trust God to know something maybe you don't know. You couldn't trust God to do for you. You, you, you had to rely on yourself. And when you have to rely on yourself and trust in yourself and get the fish that's lying right there, can I tell you, anytime we rely on ourselves, it's a trap. Anytime we think we can do something on our own, it's a trap. And we're going to embarrass ourselves. We're, we're going to embarrass ourselves to the point that all of a sudden we realize that what we once were, <laughs> we're not. And Adam and Eve were ashamed. And they hid themselves in the very creation that they were supposed to conquer, that they were supposed to tend and take care of. That our initial problem as humanity, as mankind itself, was this issue of being ashamed, of being robbed by, of our potential reality because we didn't trust that God is good. We didn't trust that God is grace. And can I tell you, tell you that religion itself promotes the fact that God is not good? Religion itself promotes the fact that if you don't measure up, Doom and gloom and despair and agony on end is going to be your future. And I've, really, I've had people walk up to me in just the last couple of weeks, write me great big notes about how you need to tell them that all hell is about to come, and if they don't turn, they're going to burn. I don't believe that. I believe that God's goodness is so powerful that if they ever get a taste of God's goodness, they won't have to worry about whatever is coming in the future, because I don't know what's coming in the future. The Bible says, I don't know. The Bible says, I'll never know. I don't know. All of that is supposition. It may be true. It may not be true. My job is not to talk about that. My job is to tell people about how Christ came, died on a cross to take our sin and our shame, that God is good and the good overcomes evil, and it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. My job is to tell the world that, you can trust God. You can trust him to be who he has always been, and that's good. Loving, forgiving, and kind. I need us to understand desperately as we turn towards the cross that we're looking at the cross as the revelation of how great God is. That there's no one else that loves the way God loves and that shame that we feel can be removed and lifted from us. The prodigal son, the great story out of Luke 15, actually my favorite chapter in the whole Bible. The prodigal son didn't think he could trust his father. Hey, give me my inheritance now because you never know what's going to happen. Give me my inheritance now because my big brother is not very nice. Give me my inheritance now <coughs> because the probate of the will might not go my way. I mean, we all know that the elder brother is a snot anyway, right? I mean, you're going to find out towards the end of the story of Luke 15 how absolutely ugly the elder brother is, right? I, I, so I don't trust my elder brother, and I don't trust you to leave a will that's substantial enough to keep. So give me mine while things are good. See, think about it. 
We've all heard the prodigal son story, but you don't really catch the reality that the, the younger son just doesn't really trust that the outcome is going to be the way he wants it, so let me have mine now. Let me have mine now. Every time we begin to mistrust God, we're headed towards a trap. Every time we think we got to take care of ourselves now, we're headed towards a snare. We're headed towards the reality that if we try to do this on our own, we might be in trouble. Because every time we try to do something on our own, we're going to end up ashamed of our own behaviors. We're going to end up realizing that we are in a pig pen. The Bible says that we are ensnared by the words of our mouth. It's actually our confession that leads us to being snared. It's actually what comes out of our mouth that traps you and me. How you doing? Well, okay, under the circumstances. You're trapped. Well, how you feeling? Well, you know, my mama had this, my daddy had it. You're trapped. Well, how about doing this? Well, I don't think I can. You're trapped. We're trapped. Our words reveal the limitations that we put on ourselves because we evaluate our potential based on what we know of ourselves. So we evaluate how good life is based on our capabilities and our abilities when the truth of the matter is is that if we're entwined with God, our future is based on his ability and his... Am I making any sense? So to, 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 to grasp the understanding that, that we need to check these words that roll up. In him will I trust, and he shall deliver me from the shame and from the... <laughs> The shame that paralyzes us, the shame that renders life hopeless, the shame of a lost marriage, the shame of a job taken away, the, the shame of our addictions, the shame of our own thoughts. I, I got to tell you, uh, it's easy to recognize what is seen, but it's my own thoughts sometimes that just I'm ashamed of. It's my own emotions, frankly, that I get ashamed of, and you don't know them, thank God. You don't know, and come on, it, it, it's, it's that inner me that really shames me. My behaviors I can tell you about and get over pretty quickly, but I know what I go to sleep thinking, what I wake up thinking. I know how many times I mistrust God throughout the day. I know how many times I'm going, I, I know how many times I, I, I discount his ability to help me in the situation that I'm in. I know how many times I get depressed. And then I read the scriptures and go, oh, I'm so ashamed. I, I, shame is what leads to these nervous breakdowns, these inherited realities. And, and, and most of the time I'm reminded by them, by the religious shame mongers of the world who take me in my sin and throw me at the feet of Christ and have a rock in this hand and are waiting to throw a rock at me because... I mean, you don't have to be caught in adultery to be ashamed. It could just be caught in a thought. And, and, and the minute that I have that thought, that righteous Pharisee on the inside of me stands up and goes, you need to be stoned. Right? I, I, I'm the one that does it, and I'm the one that judges me in my own heart. And all of a sudden, I find myself groveling in the dirt, thinking I don't deserve to be blessed. So I sentence myself, and I stay in the chicken pen with the other Former eagles. Am I making sense yet? I need to be free of my own self-imposed shame. I need to be free of my own self-imposed disappointments with me. I thought if I ate that apple, I'd be like God. I thought if I got my inheritance, I could take care of my own future. I thought I was just getting the easy fish laying on the rock. Eagles, men, and boys, they're kind of all the same. I'm, I'm, oh, maybe I'm the only one that feels ashamed of. And, and actually, you know, when you're laying there in the dirt, you think, maybe I do deserve to die. Maybe this trap is right. Maybe, but I love what the Lord says. He said, well, he who without sin, let him. <laughs> who is it that condemns you? No one. He goes, neither do I. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. 
And the son did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to free the world. Oh, my own self-condemnation that's empowered by the religious stories that I've been told about meeting the standards of whatever the denomination or society in which I live. Maybe we ought to challenge the standard or the society rather than ourselves. Maybe the society and its standards, I mean, into the society of pharisaical interpretation of the Mosaic law came the Christ. <laughs> Am I? And he challenged that religious society. Can I tell you, he didn't really challenge Rome. Rome was manipulated by the religious realities of Judaism gone amok. Oh, well, you'll get this, maybe. Can you make the correlation? It's the religious community that influences the society that ends up judging. That's really is what happened. It's happened historically over and over again. And if we're not careful, we'll get sucked right into it again. And we'll end up shaming others. And can I tell you, when you end up shaming others, you yourself will end up he who is without the first sin, they were more shamed than her. Can you feel it? Who they intended to shame are suddenly shamed because on the inside of us, we know those thoughts I was mentioning a moment ago. Christ comes to set not only the woman free of the sin and the shame, but the Pharisee as well. Not only the younger brother, but the older brother. He comes into the midst of this world that has lost confidence, into the midst of a society that's been shaped by shame, into the midst of a society whose personal stories have shaped them, whose personal abilities and personalities and, and, and experiences have determined their destiny because we've been shaped with a story that's filled with shame. We've been shaped with a society that is always contrasting and comparing one another to each other, even trying to figure out which denomination has the right story. And the only way that you're the benefactor of that story is if you meet their standard. And so we shape people, and they're more Baptist than they are Christian, more Pentecostal than they are Christian, more Methodist. They know more about that particular brand than they do about the overarching story that we've been set free. Can I make it? Am I, am I? And so we're shaped by our individual stories and heart and abilities and personalities and experiences and quite frankly we're deformed. We're deformed. We're not all we're supposed to be and many times these magnificent creatures that are made to soar above the problems are now caught in the barnyard. Hmm. Am, am I? See, we always interpret our reality by our own histories. And we are born again backwards and, and, and we step back into the leaves of the forest and we draw away from the potential that God has and, and, and we don't strike the ground or shoot the arrow we just kind of pull back and we hang and we hide ourselves from the presence of the one that's not even bothered by our nakedness from the presence of the one that already knew we couldn't depend on ourselves that's why he's here Come on. He, he doesn't, he never has run from our shame. He's never been put off by our mistakes. In fact, he keeps coming after us. The great stories of the Bible where David goes to Lodabar to get Mephibosheth. The, the, the great story where the, the prophet Hosea walks down the alley to purchase back Gomer again. I'm like, come on, this whole Bible is filled with stories and metaphors of how love chases us into our own failures and sets us free. 
That's, the, the book is full of them over and over again. And the overarching story is that God comes into the garden of our own mistake to set us free. Wow, this is the gospel. Not all those little things that people are, and certainly not all the social conversation. Those are all distractions. They're distractions to understand the power of the story that comes, that we could recover the identity that we had before we went for the fish laying on the rock. Easter. I got 15 minutes. Easter. Lent. To remember that thou art dust on Ash Wednesday. To remember that we come from dust, and to dust we shall return. To remember there's nothing all that significant about this. To remember that this was dust, but once the breath of God hit it, it becomes this life. To, to take a position of a child and to remember that we come from dust, but that we're on our way back to the retrieval of God at the cross. To understand that the only message worth talking about is the cross of Calvary. To understand what Paul says when he says, I have determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. That I have determined not to boast about anything but the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus crucified, buried, and resurrected. That that's the only thing worth discussing. To understand that the center of our faith are not the social conversations or the standards that we apply, but the cross where every sin and all shame was removed from every human being. To focus and to look, as the Hebrew writer says, looking unto the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was laid before him, despising the shame, was obedient even to death and death on the cross despising the shame. You know what it means to despise? To hate it. To destroy it. I'm going to step into your shame and I'm going to take it away because I'm tired of my eagles being limited to the barnyard and I'm going to release them once again from the shame of their own sin. I'll destroy the sin and I'll set you free. Despising the shame. God doesn't want any one of us to live shameful. The poignancy of this reality I learned standing in that foyer as I watched a mother drag two children out of the building one afternoon. Have you ever had to drag a two-year-old and a four-year-old? Yeah. yeah. I, I understood the predicament. I understood her frustration. I, I really can, can feel it. But as, that, as the other one fell and this one did something, and then she turned around and I heard these words, shame on you. And something rose up on the inside. You should be ashamed of yourself. And all of a sudden, there was this, there was this thing. And I could remember hearing those words through the course of my own life. And all of a sudden, I realized that cowering child pulling away from. And I, I suddenly recognized the trap that had been laid. Are you making, am I? <laughs> the cross is where the sin was destroyed and the shame was lifted, except by religious people. Seriously. Everybody understands that the cross removes the sin, but religious people guilt other people into the cross. And can I tell you that if we guilt people into salvation, they will fall away. If we shame people into a relationship with Christ, they will the people that are able to be intertwined with God are those that come because of God's goodness and acceptance and grace and mercy. See, if we twist the gospel and shame people into a relationship, shame will force them out. Am I making any sense? 
It's why we have to question it. And I feel old enough now to question it, <laughs> to be honest with you. Looking to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher. Say with me, he started it, and he'll finish it. I like that. He always finishes what he starts. If he began something, he'll bring it to completion, is what Paul says. He who began a good work in you, he will complete it. The author of our faith will finish it. And when he hangs on the cross, what's he say? It is finished. I finished it. You can now be obedient to it. Romans 1.5 says, be obedient to the faith. Didn't say obedient to the law. Didn't say be obedient to the denomination. It said be obedient to the faith. What's the faith? Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. Trust his goodness. Trust his mercy. Trust his grace. Trust his love. Trust that he can destroy the sin and remove the shame so that you can soar again. Hmm. Oh, well. And he looked down on him, passed over a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One looked at him and the people turned away. We looked down on him and thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, and all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed our sins. He took the punishment that made us whole, and by his stripes... We are healed. We are all sheep who have wandered off and got lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him. On him. That's the cross. That's the message of the church. And if the church is not going to preach that, they need to shut up. Amen. If the church is not going to preach Isaiah 53, that by his stripes... If it's not going to preach that he took our sin and our shame, then they're not the church. That's the message. It's the only message. It's the only hope you and I have. It's the only thing that can change our lives. It's the only story. And he goes on in Isaiah 54, do not fear for you will not be ashamed. Touch your neighbor and said, you will not be. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and not remember the reproach of your widowhood any longer. And then hear the words of Paul in Romans 9, 33, and in 10, 11, he echoes it, whoever believes on me will not be put to... Anybody here believe? Yes. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ then we need to be looking at someone and say, don't be ashamed. Be free. Don't be ashamed. Fly again. Don't be ashamed. Mount up on the wings of the Holy Spirit and return to the rightful creature that you were made to be. Get up. Oh, okay, so you were silly and you went for the dead fish. You were silly and you demanded the inheritance early. But wake up. Come to yourself and fly again. Oh, come on. Quit allowing. I got to be careful. So, but the son returned. Yeah, because the son knew better. The son knew better. There are a lot of us in this room that knew better. Come on, you ever know better but do it anyway? Does that mean you got to be born again again? No, it means you need to wake up. Listen, I got born again 54 times in one year. <laughs> At 12 years old, I walked the aisle 54 times in the same year. Why? Because the only thing I knew to do was get born again. No, I just needed to wake up and return. Not because I was... Listen, I got saved 54 times because Pastor Shepard said, if you walk out that door and get hit by a truck, do you know where you're going? Obviously not. <laughs> Certainly wasn't paying attention if you get hit by it. I mean, I, you got to think of a 12-year-old in their head going, well, if you just opened your eyes, you wouldn't get hit. No. 
Come on, literally. I'm sitting there in the first Nazarene church of every Candace thinking, well, if you'd open your eyes, you wouldn't get hit by a truck. I repeated that over and over and over again, and then finally I realized, if I open my eyes, I realize Christ is here. Oh, good Lord. He came to himself, and he came up out of it, and it, it was over, and it was... Can I tell you that, that, that Jesus comes into our shame? He comes into that place where we are hopeless. He comes into that place where we don't think we can ever. Paul says, when all hope was lost, Abraham said, it's too late, I'm too old. In that, we need to be telling people that in that moment where they themselves have failed, that God comes into that failure. He comes into that moment. It's not that they have to get up out of that moment and fix themselves. It's that they can, be, they can receive that he's with them. In the midst of that mess, he comes into that nakedness. you got to realize, you have to understand that in the garden, our attention is drawn to the nakedness of Adam and Eve. But at Calvary, the attention of the world, the attention of every subsequent generation is drawn to the nakedness of God. <laughs> Why? Because he took our nakedness. If anyone wants to look at your nakedness or your mistakes and your shortcomings, tell them to take a glance at the one that hung on the cross. Because anytime I get ashamed of myself, I glance at the cross and suddenly his presence is greater than mine. Am I making any sense? And I recognize at that moment that I'm not dependent upon myself. I glance at that cross and my sin and my shame are removed. And I can hear the words of the Christ, deny thyself. Deny thyself. Pick up that cross. Your sins are forgiven, son. Pick up the mat and walk. It's the same story. Deny thyself. Quit depending on yourself. Quit depending on you, me, myself, and I. Stop it. Pick up that mat. Pick up your personal story. Pick, pick up your story. Own it. Come on. Own it. This, this is my story. This, this is the mess I got into. This is the thoughts that I... Pick it up. Don't hide it. Don't shrink into the shadows, but just... Pick it up. It's your testimony. It's your witness that I came into that mess. I came into that life, into that experience. I'm not afraid of your sin or your shame. I came into it. Now, it, it used to hold you down, but pick it up. I've given you strength to pick it up and to follow me. Following him doesn't remove the story that I've lived. It just means that the story that I've lived doesn't hold me down. Oh, this is... Come on, we're going to journey towards Easter the next several weeks together. Let's pick up the cross now. And let's walk to the resurrection together. That story that used to burden you, now you can pick it up. Because I took its power. I took its shame. So pick it up. Own the story that you went after the fish that was laying on the rock. Own the story that you demanded your stuff too early. Own the story that you ate the apple you shouldn't have eaten. Own the story you were the adulterer in the dust. Own it, whatever it is, but pick it up. Because there's a couple of things that are going to witness to the reality of the love of God. And number one is your story has met his story. And when your story meets his story, can I tell you, his story lifts yours. And some of you have forgotten that your life has a surprise ending. Have you ever watched a great movie? And there was this wonderful surprise ending where you didn't see that coming, right? The Bible says your end is better than your beginning, the Bible says the glory of the end of your life is greater than the glory of your... Oh, come on. The cross is where your story and his story 
It X marks the spot where, where your story hits his story and all of a sudden your story, and you can pick it up and carry it now. And you can own it. That's my story, but I met the Christ. And now I can do all things through the Christ who strengthens me. Am I? Come on. Feel this. Go shout it for the next four or five weeks and tell everybody, don't wait to Easter to come to church. Don't wait for the play to hear the story. Don't, don't, don't wait. Oh, well. I got I, 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 Listen, I'm, I'm a little... I, I told Terry this a few days ago. I was reading the Gospels. I, I love reading the Gospels during this time. I'm reading the Gospel where... You remember the two thieves, one on this and one on this? You remember the one cursed him and the other one? You remember? And, and so, hmm, hmm, right? I mean, if you, if you hear the story, you think one did, one didn't kind of thing. But hear the words of Christ. Father, forgive that one, not that one. That's not what he said. You do understand that both of them were forgiven that day. Both of them. Father, forgive him and him. Him got up and carried his cross. My choice is yours. The sin's destroyed. The stuff is over. Do we cower in our sin and our shame? Or do we hear the words, your sins? Are forgiven. Pick it up. Pick it up. Quit letting it. The door's open. The chains are broken. Finish your story. Isaiah says, instead of shame, I'll give you double honor. Instead of confusion, they will rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double In their land, not in their future. Not tomorrow when we die. But in your land, now. Double honor. Instead of shame on you, I honor you. And if I have to pick you up and carry you, I will. I honor you. The church should be honoring each and every soul. One on this side and one on this side. Each one, double honor. The church should be manifesting Am I, the shamelessness. I've been preaching on supernatural, right? Isn't that the word? Say supernatural. supernatural. You know, in order to live supernaturally, you have to live shamelessly. That you have to step up out of the shame, pick it up. And if you do, you're going to experience supernatural. Eagle, get up and fly again. Get up and soar again. Get up and confront your own personal judgment of yourself. I don't know how to do that any better, to be honest with you. You, you. Did you know that once the eagle is free to fly again, somehow, some way, he gets pushed off the cliff and he... You, I've, I've watched this. This is just as real as I can tell you. The eagle that was shamed into the barnyard reality has to be picked up and carried to the edge of a cliff and thrown off. I'm scared of heights. Every time I've watched this video, it... it I, You ever been so trapped by your own shame that the idea of having to fly again just scares the snot out of you? But in order to get the eagle to recover who he is, they pick him up, take him to about 12,000 feet, and throw him again. The initial reaction, right? And his mate's been waiting. 
his bridegroom, his mate for life, the one that will never leave, never forsake, the one that is covenanted. Oh, you're in the room. We'll take the formerly shamed eagle to a cave. And the shamed eagle instinctively knows to take its beak and beat it against the wall of the cave until the, cave, the beak is sharp again. And then begins to pluck his feathers off of his own body. Pull them to reveal his own nakedness. Just pull, just strips himself of every weight and sin that so easily ensnares. And now he's, you know, naked birds can't fly. <laughs> Just because you were thrown off the cliff and you soared momentarily and you're born again doesn't mean you don't need to go through the process of recovering the reality of who you are. Praying the prayer is not the end, but the beginning of a restoration. <laughs> you had to put a new robe on the prodigal, a new ring on his hand. It's a process. And then he goes and stands under the nearby waterfall for 40 days while new feathers grow. And his mate feeds him. And then after all the feathers are there, he waits another 10 days for the oil sacks under his wings to fire up. And that oil comes over those feathers and covers those wings with oil so that the things that he flies through doesn't stick. So this message, I'm fairly confident everybody in this room knows Jesus. Fairly confident. Some of you need to go pluck everything off. And Lent's a great time. Lent's a great time to put oneself in a place of humility. To strip off and reveal the scars and the wounds and the it's a great time to stand under the waterfall of his spirit and to be fed by the hands of the Lord and to let new things cover. Why Lent? Because it's a really nice process. So if you need to return home, Return to that relationship where you're free of shame. Boy, start now. Don't wait till resurrection. We'll start now. Deny yourself. Pick up that cross. Start now. If we're ensnared by the words of our mouth, we're also set free. For I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. That he died on the cross, was buried, and on the third day he rose again. That I'm forgiven by his blood, redeemed. That his spirit fills my heart. That I'm twisted with him. That Jesus is my Lord, my Savior, who destroyed the sin and the shame. 